I've always been incredibly passionate about integrating PR and SEO, even before link building became as big as it was. I've been helping PRs and SEOs work together on a strategic business level for quite a while, but I also work on a tactical level, creating campaigns to build links and get coverage. Behind me, you can see a selection of places where I've placed content and built links from over the last year. And today, I'm going to talk to you about some of the tactics and strategies that I've used to help place these. Now, I know it sounds kind of crazy, but you don't need media relationships to get coverage or links. It really helps, but it's not everything. But building better media relationships will it significantly increase the, comp the impact of your content marketing because it will change the way you structure your content. It will change the way you package your content and it will change the way you deliver your content. Now I could give you a whole load of tactics we use in PR and make you more PR. But really, do you want to be just PR or do you want to be better than PR? Exactly. And if you want to be better, we actually have to rewind a bit and take a second look at Panda. Now, you'll have your own preconceptions about what Panda meant, but for me, Panda was really different. I was working in an SEO firm at the time, and I get a call from our Seattle office at some god-awful hour, I think it was about 2 a.m., saying that Panda's going to roll out in the UK. So we pulled together a statement, and I started calling media. And I called, and I called, and I called, and nobody cared. Nobody cared at all. They said, SEO isn't relevant to my business, it isn't relevant to my publication, my, or my readers, and it's not relevant to me as a journalist. Are you sure? Are you really sure? Anyway, perseverance, as with all PR, wins. And I eventually found somebody at Sky News who, let's be honest, was bored enough to cover the story. Um, a perfect world, I'd like to believe that he really got it, but look at his headline, why Google Panda is good for businesses. Really, was it, initially? But then this happened. All these other big publications, IT Pro Portal, PocketLint, they all got hit, and it was brilliant. It was absolutely fantastic, because it fundamentally changed the way that publishers saw SEO. It changed the nature of their jobs, and it changed their perception of SEO, but SEOs themselves. We were no longer this kind of dirty word stuck in the back corner of a building or an office. We were superheroes. We were there to save the day. And this really had quite a big impact on my relationships with media. I used to meet with them and say, hey, I've got this cool client, this amazing content. But actually, now we started to talk about what the fabric of their business was made up of. And it was made up of traffic, because traffic brought advertisers, and traffic was their customers. So suddenly, they saw SEO in a very different light. And so when we started talking more about the fundamental aspects of their business, I started to devise all my strategies to take this into account. It was the foundation for everything I do. So if you focus your strategies on helping the media overcome their challenges, you will be significantly better. In fact, you'll be 10 steps ahead of every seasoned PR out there. And that's where you should be aiming for. Not to be a PR, not to be as good as PRs at outreach and content, but to be better. So what are these challenges? Clearly, Google is a big issue for them. They understand less about it. And at this point in time, they're really struggling with not provided. They're losing advertisers to Facebook because it can be more easily um, attributed. And they don't know what's most popular on their content. They don't know how to devise their content strategies based on what content is performing best. So if you're pitching a publication, Look at their social channels. Look at what is really doing well for them. And when you call them, say, hey, I realize that this is doing really good on your social channels and has done historically. It will be one of the strongest pitches you put forward because that's how their peers see them and that's how they're judged. And Google authorship. 
Now, even though the photos don't show up in SERPs anymore, a lot of publishers and journalists are actually negotiating their salaries based on the strength of their Google Plus profiles. You should look at these, because that is where you're going to hit their pockets. If you create content that they can put on those channels and share, you're going to create a good relationship. Furthermore, the publications themselves are equally going to be looking for um, uh, Google Plus links to enhance their profiles. So if you can't get a link to your client's website, get one to their Google Plus profile. And it's really simple. Put their website into top pages. Have a look. Get past, of course, the home page, category pages, and have a look at what type of content is performing best. Then repackage your pitch to fit that. And show them. They love to see it. Now, when I used to pitch Huffington Post, I would talk to them about things like, I've got a great story that suits your audience. Now, when I call up Stephen Hull, he's editor for the news in, um, at Huffington Post UK, I just say, hey, Stephen, I've got a story that will allow you to target this key term. And you know, the last time I called him, he didn't even ask what the story was. He just said, send it. Not all journalists are here yet. Not all editors are here yet, but they're fast getting there. If you can spend time with your contacts and nurture this, no PR is going to be doing this. We did this with um, a client called SwiftKey. They have this awesome app. It essentially learns how you speak, how you type. So um, you can predict whole sentences. And I knew that over the Queen's Jubilee, that loads of tech publications were going to be missing out on search volume for the term Jubilee, because it kind of doesn't fit with TechCrunch or Pocketlin all that well. So SwiftKey and I pulled in all the Queen's speeches, so you could essentially text like the Queen over the Jubilee. And this meant that they could target that search term, and it got coverage everywhere, even in lifestyle. And that was fantastic, because it was a two-way benefit, short and sweet. Articles that are written on long form do not work for a lot of publishers. Make them short. Make them 400 words. If your article can't be written in 400 words, split it into a series and pitch that instead. Now, it's not just Google that's an issue. There are thousands of redundancies being made everywhere in all the different media sectors. And this is causing strain on internal teams and it's also causing a growth in mass amounts of freelancers. And this is awesome. This is really, really good news. Because you can contract them to do work, and they'll do it better than anybody you're going to train up from who's just out of school, because they understand the business of media. So get them to write the forwards to your white papers. If you don't have someone, you can write a press release. Get a journalist to do it. I work for a PR firm, I'm a PR, and I still get journalists now and again to write a press release or to look over it, because it builds the relationship. And they want that content to do well, because they want that work. So it's in their interest to call a few buddies and sell it in for you as well. It's easily done. All you have to do is look on Press Gazette, and it's got all the sectors of media, and you can target sport, pharmaceuticals, health, fashion, and find top journalists in that area. But please, please make sure they've written in that sector recently. A journalist's career naturally meanders over time. And they may say that they've worked in sport, but when you actually ask them, it might be three, four years since they did so. So just double check that. Now, managing m media movement in current day is really tough. A few years ago, I could just get my little black book out and write you a press list. That's really not possible in current day. Like my little black book, these people are jumping left, right, and center. I can't cross out the names and publications and move them over fast enough. So you need a good media management system. Now, Buzzstream is awesome. Um, I'm sure there's loads you could use. This is what we use in-house. So if you've got a team of more than two, you need to be doing this. But furthermore, some of the best coverage our company has got this year has been site searching. Take the site, take your key term associated with your story, and find who's written about it most recently, because the best media tracking is only as good as the last time you spoke to that journalist. 
Journalists also have a lot less time. You know, the, the beauty of journalism used to be being able to find the perfect case study, get the perfect quote, get the beautiful images and craft this piece of content for the world. That doesn't happen anymore. They don't have the time for it. If you want your content to be the piece that's chosen, you've got to create content assets that orbit your campaign. If you do this, you will reduce the risk of failure and increase impact significantly because you make it easier and quicker for journalists to write those articles. Ideally, you want these hosted on your website because it will build links, but Dropbox is great too. Lots of journalists prefer it and you know, you've got to meet them halfway. One of the things I always put in my Dropbox is a Q&A relating to the content piece I've made whether it's a Q&A about how it was built, about why it was built, about the key subject matter, get that written up. And this is really good to write in advance if you've got nervous clients or people who take forever to sign stuff off because it can be written in advance, it can be signed off and in that Dropbox. Equally, quotes. Get yourself a list of quotes that different media can use. I always write these myself and send them over to the client because if you write them, send them over, even if they completely shred it and put it back together because they want to say something else, they will shred it and put it back together quicker than if you didn't send it to them at all. And case studies. You know, news isn't the only coverage you can get. Case studies form like a massive part of all publishing, no matter what sector you're targeting. And these are easy to get. Email your customers, clients, if you can. Otherwise, you go on Response Source, which is like a paid for Harrow, or Harrow itself, or even Twitter. You'd be surprised. People will help you. Get one of these written up. Get some photos and get that in your press pack as well. And image galleries. This is where I think people miss out all the time. But you know, so many websites have those little boxes that you can scroll through of pictures and there's like a little bit of text, a little bit of text. Those are fantastic ways to get coverage for a project that maybe didn't make it into news. You couldn't get a Q&A about or you didn't have a case study for. We did this with Zombie. This is my best friend's tortoise. And we created an image gallery for a story. We eventually, we were looking at web analytics and we found out my greeting cards client actually had a lot of people sending Valentines to and from their pets, which I kind of thought was a little weird. That being said, we just took a whole load of photos of really cute pets and unusual ones, hence zombie, and that's what got us the coverage. That piece there would not have happened if the journalists had had to go and look for those images because they just don't have time for that. I've given you some tips behind as well about ways you can structure your images to be more impactful and media ready. Now Halo or gaming PR is actually one of the best areas you can analyze. If you want to set your bar somewhere, set it at gaming PR because it's one of the toughest areas for media to work in. And that's very largely because they're starting to compete with corporate blogs, which is really tough. You know, they're getting announcements made on the corporate blog and they've got to find a way to repackage it on their website for their audience. So, you know, they'll do that with commentary or analysis, but you know how I just said put everything in the Dropbox? Well, there's one thing you shouldn't. Keep a little bit back, whether it's a few images, a screenshot, a quote or two. Because if you're working with clients, they're announcing everything on their site, you've got to give journalists something else. And I promise you, they will cover you quicker if you can offer them something unique that they can offer their readers to. Now, the globalization of media is bad for journalists because there's less jobs. Um, it's really good for us because what's happening is, um, CNET's actually a good example. CNET UK and CNET USA, a couple of months ago, merged. They're one publication. So if I call CNET UK, or the UK journalists, and they don't want to cover my story, that's just fine. I'll wait until one o'clock London time, and then I'll just call New York. And you know what, if New York don't want it, I'll call San Francisco. It's not a problem, I'll just keep going. And this is where you guys should be thinking now. It's not about localized outreach. Their publications are seeing themselves as global, so your outreach should be as well. And vacations. Vacations are hard to take when you've got a big workload and when you've got fewer staff. And journalists really struggle with this. 
But again, this is our, our opportunity. What you can do is pitch them a whole load of content before Christmas or any key holiday, and they'll just store it up. They'll just line it up ready to go. I mean, I don't know if you've done much link building over December, but it's probably one of the most dire times to do link building. Nobody's there, no one answers your email, but you've still got to keep plugging away. Do it all by the 1st of November, and then you can sit back and you can go on vacation. National holidays, you want to pitch one to two weeks before. They'll be grateful, and you'll be grateful. So all these tips are great, right? You've got great outreach tips, but then you're like, well, actually, I need some really good stories. Look at Lego. You want inspiration? Lego win time and time again. Just look at the search results for them, for news. It's just story after story. They're awesome at it. Whether they're doing spoofs about old films and targeting cult fans, whether they're launching their first science, um, female scientist range. They're fantastic, and they get loads of coverage. And this is in part because they get those bits right. They get the images right and they get a third party voice in their stories. And this is really critical. You don't just want your client being quoted. Here they've got a psychologist being quoted. It's not that hard to find a psychologist. You go into Google, you go into news, you type psychologist and you see who's being quoted. You already know they're not frightened to speak to media and they're likely to speak to you. This third voice will change how much coverage you get. And Lego do newsjacking like nobody else does newsjacking. Um, this is Glastonbury, um, which we just had in London. Now, it's all well and good to say, OK, fine, you've got Glastonbury, and they can do this quickly. You can do this quickly. Just don't try and write a press release. Write what looks exactly like a press release and call it a media alert. It's amazing. It doesn't need high-level sign-off. And it's exactly the same thing. You can move fast. And most events you can plan for. This is um, a royal baby bath that we made for the birth of King George. And so, uh, Prince George, sorry. Um, we put up a product page. We got it on back order. We got a blog post up about it with an interview with a midwife. And then we got loads of links to it and coverage from all the media because it was topical. You know, product spoofs are fine, but if you hook them to a, a topical event, they'll be even more impactful. And what was even cooler, I knew that there were loads of journalists sitting outside the hospital waiting for Kate to have this baby, and they were bored stiff. So I just thought, you know what? Get me a bathrooms.com delivery guy. Got him down, got a big ribbon wrapped around the bath, and I just said, you just walk up and down in front of those all that press. Just keep doing it, keep doing it. And we got them on TV, we got loads more coverage, because we had a physical object. And this is a key factor. Offline influences online. We wouldn't have been able to do this otherwise. And the cost of this? Biggest cost was the red ribbon, because I used the client's internal budget to buy the bath. It didn't hit my budget. Red ribbon is really expensive. It was almost $400. I'm not complaining. It wasn't that expensive overall as a project. But $400 for a red ribbon is unbelievable. Now, I don't like failure. It demotivates my team. It demotivates my clients. It breaks trust. So I wanted to create a project where I could have figures that would grow over time, but I could actually be hammering the same story out over and over again. So again, this was around the royal birth. I thought. People are going to be cyber squatting when um, the King George's name when it gets announced. So I thought, great, I'm going to write a press release ahead of time, get those figures, and I went out and I PR'd it. About, I don't know, about three in ten people said yes and published it. Well, the next day the figures were bigger, so I changed the number and called all those other people back and said, you know how you said it wasn't big enough or important enough? Well, now they're double. Oh, you're still not interested? OK, end of the week, I'll ring you again. Same story, different numbers, over and over again. And we ended up getting international coverage, one release. We just changed the numbers. We do the same with Kickstarter at my firm. We go out and we say, this Kickstarter project is launching. Then we go out and say, this Kickstarter project has reached its target. Then we say, it's doubled its target. It's the same release, the same story, but you're just building the drama. And of course, we do all the other stuff. We do the, um, the Q and A's. We do the good images. And then we get them in front of important people. 
you know, if they're going to go meet David Cameron and um, Prince Harry, well, I'm going to tell the journalist that didn't cover it on my first four releases about that, and he might want to cover it then. The results? Well, they speak for themselves. And actually, just as a side note, if you want to build up a website ready for sales, Kickstarter is awesome. Most of our clients go from having a website that didn't exist to a DA of like 50 in like a couple of weeks. Just saying, you may not need the money, you might need the SEO. Color themes are interesting. So we noticed that The Wizard of Oz, which I really like, by the way, had two color themes last year. It had emerald and it had gold. And then The Great Gatsby came out, and that had a whole load of gold as well. So when HTC came to us and said, get us loads of coverage, we made a gold HTC. Seemed sensible. But we wanted to reduce the risk of failure. So I thought, let's break the strategy up. Let's cut it into pieces. So we did a private view, and we launched it there. And then we got on the phone, and we sold it in. And then we did a media tour, which meant going to all the publications' offices. And I thought, well, that's kind of boring. Unless I get the biggest, baddest bodyguard in the world to come with me, that sounds kind of cool. But what's a big, bad bodyguard without a bomb-proof case, right? So you sit down, you apologize for the bodyguard and say it's just a big project, you know, it's very highly pricey, and oh, excuse the bomb-proof case, and they, they reach in. They reach in to get the phone, you're like, no, don't do it. You've got to put the white gloves on, man. Media loved it. You're creating this excitement, this theater around it, and you're only on launch three. So then we took it to the MOBO Awards, and we thought, you know what? We'll tell people that we're taking it to the MOBOs, and then when somebody wins and they get the gold phone, we'll tell the media about it then. What I've skimmed over is how hard it is to make a solid gold phone. Just so you know, it's really, really difficult. And then two people won. Should have been kind of pleased. It was a pretty tough day. But then we didn't stop there. I mean, why would you stop there? So it rolled out across all the O2 stores in the UK. So then you can go to marketing media and talk about it again, launch five. Well, this is Times Square. We rolled it out in Times Square, and it worked there. So then we just decided, well, we'll roll it out globally. That's another you know, 40, 50 launches. Coverage, clearly, global. One story, breaking up the strategy. If one had failed, we had another six to go, another seven, another eight. But the ultimate impact of this, it showed HTC that actually maybe they should reconsider their product strategy. Color is that important. You can now buy gold look HTCs. If you want to buy a solid gold one, $4,500. Maybe not the biggest figure for media, but don't worry about it. You want to call an insurance firm and say that you want to value something at a million dollars? It's not that difficult to get someone to do it for you. Gives you a nice big number for media. I put all my tips on a summary slide for you. But if you're going to remember three things, make the media's job easier. Pick your ideas that can grow over time because it will reduce your risk. And set up partnerships like we did with Mobos or O2 for the HTC phone, because you're leveraging somebody else's reputation, and you're getting that joint impact. If people aren't interested in you, they'll be interested in that brand. Thank you very much. Well, I'm a, little, I'm a little intimidated. That's like a master class in PR. <laughs> uh, what impresses me so much is that it, it reminds me of that Don Draper Mad Men quote. Uh, I didn't realize how much creativity was involved in what you do. And the Don Draper quote, if you don't like the conversation, change, ch if you don't like what people are talking about, change the conversation. And it seems like in your PR strategies here, you're not just telling a story, you're creating the story. Uh, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I think creating the story is really key. You can at least control it then. Yeah, and it seems like you're making the story even more interesting. Uh, now, I'm going to be a complete noob here because I, I, uh, this is all very new to me. Uh, relationships in PR. Yeah. Those first few contacts when you're talking to editors, when you're talking to reporters. What is important to remember about those first few contacts so you start the relationship off on a good foot? I like to stalk them quite a lot beforehand. Um, I always check they're online first, because there's no point in emailing them if they're not going to be online, right? 
because then you get disheartened because they don't answer. Um, make it really quick and easy, like really short. I'm coming past your offices. I've got a really great story. I'd love to introduce myself. Can I bring you a coffee? Do you like croissants? Something quite small and quick. And you talked about persistence. Is there a danger of going too far? Yeah, there is, and it does happen. But my experience is that most people don't go far enough. Wow. Well, thank you, Lexi. I, it was really awesome. That's right.